Okay, okay, Walter. I'm always cutting off Walter. Or Walter. It must, I think his ears ring every every uh, time I do that. See you, Walter. <laughs> um, but you will have a chance to see Walter and me live in the Czech Republic in September. And maybe in Italy in July. July, we're hoping that comes together. And so, uh, yeah, hoping that happens. Thank you for everybody being here. Uh, I'm flying solo here with the moderation. BB's not here. Um, so, you know, nobody post anything that I have to keep on deleting. <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay. So, uh, I got a few things is on sale. I got new courses coming soon. There's lots of cool things coming down the pipeline um, that have been taking me away from... Uh, banging out new courses, but it's all good. I'm going to be starting a subscription service uh, shortly, and it's a really cool format I'm really excited about, uh, where we work on something for a period of time, like a month, and then we kind of go through each month, and it's I think it'll be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to it. Just want to make sure it's all right when I do it. Angus is here, or Angus can moderate. I wouldn't ask, I can do it. So Angus is here, Angus, Angus Clark, personal friend of mine. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's been keeping me busy. Uh, other stuff coming down the pipeline. So I'm looking forward to all these things that are kind of cool. And um, so today we're going to talk about dialing in overdrive pedals. Now, one thing I've discovered is that everything I play sounds exactly the same. So you might say, hey, Jeff, everything you're playing sounds pretty much the same. And I think that's a, that happens to a lot of us. When people, some people ask me, like, why don't I do more pedal demos? you know, like uh, Pete Thorne or my friend Corey or uh, RJ or someone, uh, because I, I think I end up sounding very similar versus like all of them, you know? So today I'm going to talk about, somebody's just asking right here, John Smith, good morning, from uh, Brisbane, Australia. I'm interested in gain staging versus boosting an overdrive. I'm going to talk about some of that today too. Yeah, so cool. All right, so the first thing is I've got some courses on sale. I've got my Solo Blues course that is 50% off if you don't already have it. It's a great way to help me and the channel. Uh, help. The only way to help me in the channel <laughs> is to pick up uh, courses. I appreciate it. And also I have 30% off the Triad Bundle, so that's all my four Triad courses, all for one low pr price of 30% off. And uh, great. Okay. So let's dig in. And then if you have questions, please hit it with the question mark first. And we'll get to those shortly. We got some people here today. All right, so um, where's my, here's, I'm gonna slip over the pedal board for a minute. So here's the pedal board I'm gonna be using today. I'm gonna talk about a few different things. You can see I've got a few things lined up, some common ones, some not so common, some relatively inexpensive, some, I don't have any really inexpensive pedals, but you know, I, I want to put a kind of a, a, a mix of things. And we'll plug in an overdrive in a little bit, which I have the Vemram, which people really like, as do I. So today we're playing, we've got our clean tone. I'm playing through my two rock. Um, there we go. I'm playing through my two rock uh, Bloomfield drive into the ox. And so I'm just getting, we're going to go through a clean channel. Well, we're going to do a few things. First, I'm going to start off with the way I would run an amplifier, which would be maybe a little overdriven. So let me hit the overdrive channel. Okay, so nice, I think, guitar tone, I would hope. So what we're gonna do, um, is go through how I would normally use a overdrive as a boost. So when I use an overdrive pedal on the floor, I'm using it in con like faking the sound of an overdriven amplifier, right? So here's my overdriven amplifier sound. So now to me, my rhythm guitar sound would be, we've talked about this many times if you follow me on the channel, uh, me rolling back my volume knob. So here's my full volume. Go back to volume. All right, kind of the bridge pickup. Okay, so there's my kind of my different tones. Roll back that volume knob to find the sweet spot where it cleans up. 
And I never play with a super sparkly clean tone. I just um, don't really love that. Every kind of guitar tone I have will be sort of on that cliche edge of breakups. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. I am reversed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me see if I can fix that. Hold on, just here I'm reversed. That's weird. Yeah, hold on. Let me see what I can do. Thank you. Flip. Oh, wrong one. Hold on a second, guys. This is uh. It's not showing me as reverse. So hold on one second. I can get this done. Better? Is that better? What do you guys? Yeah. Okay. Tell me if that's better. Okay. It's so weird how this, uh, I'm using OBS and then I upgraded uh, to the latest version of it and it, it, it refic, it just did a bunch of things itself. So better? Let me know. All right. So. Clean tone, relatively clean tone. So now let's go through some of the pedals here. Let's start off right here. We've got the Tumnus, which is basically a, a Klon, right? A mini Klon, very affordable. Great pedal. I have all sorts of stuff. I have, um, it sounds the same, right? I have all sorts of, I got a, I don't have a Klon anymore. I sold it or traded it. I have a KTR. I've got some sort of Klon clones. This is just great. You know, just you want to get a clone, a Klon clone. The tum, this is awesome. So let's hear this. So what I'm going to do, one of the things when I use an overdrive for gain staging, part of the thing is you might want to roll off some of the low end, okay? So the low end can be a bit mushy when you do that. So let me, let me go over here first because this, this has got a lot of low end if I want. So I'm going to set everything noon on the Buddy G or Booty G from Vemram, which I really, really like a lot. But I'm going to set it at noon. And... Right, there's a lot of low end going on. So what I would normally do in a situation like this with any overdrive pedal that I'm using is I would start to shave off some of that low end because it's going to take away a lot of the focus when you're playing, right? So you're gonna get that flubby thing going on, which I don't really love, let's hear it. Now if I just dial back that low end, there's my bass control. See, so it's already tightened everything up. Now but what I like about all these pedals that I've chosen, you have the option to kind of do that with most of them, or you just turn up the, the treble control or if there's a tone knob, you find the sweet spot for that. I think um, that is the key thing is to learning how to shave off some of that low end or experimenting. And the best way I do it, it's like you hit that, if you go to the neck pickup, it's most prevalent on the neck pickup I find because you know the, the string is vibrating wider there. So, so I'm gonna turn it all the way up. And if I drop back a bit, a lot actually. Right, so that to me is a spot we want to get to. All right, so let's go over the Klon style. And I'm going to set everything at noon. So now the Klon style stuff, if we look on the, the Thomas, I had to write this in because I always missed it on a gig. So that's gain, volume, and treble. Now the Klon stuff, I, I've always heard generally the gain has to be at at least more than a quarter or something like that to kick in or else it's a clean boost. Now, I do like it as a clean boost. So let's hear it as a clean boost too. So I'm going to turn the gain down. And just based upon volume and treble. I play a lot of the same. The strat licks. Now if I turn up my treble, I can get a little more. A little more bite on the note. The cool thing about the Klon stuff, and we'll notice in a second, is what the Klon initially does, if my, I'm sure somebody would correct me if I'm wrong, but the real Klon, if you look inside of them, there's a pot and there's a double pot. And as you turn up the gain, it does roll off some of the low end. So he solved that problem. So as I turn up the gain, you get more mids.
and you can dial in the high end as you want. Now it pushes that mids for it. So let's hear that low end on that e, on that again as it kind of goes through it. Let me try to do this. I put, should have put the pedals on the other side. So as I turn up the gain, you're actually getting more mids. And sometimes at home, if you're just kind of hanging out playing, you're like, Ugh. like as we get to the King of Tone over here, it's got sort of a tube screamer side. Sometimes it's not my favorite sound when you're at home uh, because it's a lot of mids, but on a gig, it pushes you through the band properly. And that's really important. I think it's a lot of stuff that people overlook is that the frequency that's most important, important when you're trying to cut through is going to be the mids. So that's why the Klon, it's one of the reasons why the Klon style stuff is so popular. All right, so. We just start tweaking it a little bit. Let's, let's crank up that gain. So you see, that's really mid rangey So I don't know anybody who cranks the gain on 10 with one. Kind of seems to be somewhere about this. That's where I kind of like it. Something almost stuff somewhere around noon. Treble depending. But I, like the, I don't like the gain up too much. Because I think when the gain is up too much, it gets too mid rangey for me. So that's something I don't, I try to avoid. It gets a bit too harsh. All right, so. That's the first thing I would say. If you start to experiment with how to use uh, boosting the front end of an amp. So we're doing what's called gain staging. So we're taking the overdriven sound of the amplifier, hitting the front end of the amp harder, volume wise, and maybe adding in some uh, gain from the pedal. Also, but I think almost more importantly is what you're adding is, is EQ. And you're detract or you're taking away some of the low end. Okay, so. What did I get wrong on the come on? Um, I think the, 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 now the um, KTR does, it's got a blues breaker times two. Is it blues breaker times two? I thought one was sort of a, a tube screamer side. I think it is a bit of a tube screamy side. I've got the box. We can take a look. All right. So. so to me, that's a very distinctive sound that the Klon has. And I do like it a lot, actually. Uh, but I like it best in context. All right. So my next one here that I really, really like a lot is the Vemram ODG, which is a bit more of a clean thing. So let's send the gain all the way off very slightly. There's a, a knob on the on the, in, on the side there that I can add in a degree of saturation. So here... To me, this one's more neutral sounding, right? At this point, I kind of have the bass down a bit, but if I put everything at noon, see how that sounds? Except the gain. Why don't I get this? Not too much gain. To me, it's just really pushing the front end a bit more. I'm not hearing a huge tonal thing. That's one of the reasons I really like this pedal. It doesn't quite have the mid hump that some of these other ones have, and that's one thing I do like about it. it would have been maybe cool if they put a mid control in it, where I always want to say these companies like, put bass middle treble or a mid sweep, and some companies do this. But I do like this pedal a lot. I'll go into it a little bit more in a minute. Now, if I want to crank up the gain, now as I crank up the gain, I'll probably drive back, drive, dial back the bass. And I can decide obviously how much gain I want. That's a lot. So that's a little woolly. So I'm going to pull that bass down here. So there for me, I 
finding that sweet spot is really, really important because a little bit too much of the bass, especially on the neck pickup, the neck pickup is always sort of the way I, um, I measure how much, where it is. Because the bridge pickup, we'll talk about in a second. If I get the bridge, if I get the neck dialed in to where I get that cool, hollow, awesome, flutey, whatever you want to call it, strat sound. Now, if you had real volume here, that makes also a big difference. So sometimes you have more gain on a pedal at home and then you go on a gig and you're like, oof, that's way too much gain. Then if I have it set here, when I go to my bridge, and we've talked about this if you follow my channel and seen some of my videos, I have the tone knob hooked up to the bridge pickup on all my guitars. So that levels it out. So this is pretty bitey. It's cool, but it's a bit sharp. So I just... even them out by using a tone knob on the bridge. I know I've talked about this a million times, but I think it's really important as you're dialing in your overdrive pedals to dial everything in for the neck pickup if you change your pickups a lot. Um, because when you have the tone knob on the bridge pickup, you can take off some of that high end that you do need, I find, for the neck pickup to be right. When I switch to a humbucker wool, it's definitely more prevalent. So I always dial in for the neck with the overdrive, and then I'll roll back the tone knob on the bridge for when, uh, well, when I go to the bridge. All right, so. Now I could also, you know, boost the treble. What I think, I, I generally try to detract sometimes more so than add. I, I, Depending on the pedal, I might add some high end. I just contradict myself, but I'm usually trying to take away some of the low end and maybe, depending on the amplifier and the guitar, boost the top end just a little bit. I find that that really works when you're using the overdrive as a gain stage situation because then you are cutting that frequency, pushing a bit more forward. Sometimes adding in those highs really helps out uh, the articulation of the note. So I'll show you what I mean. Drop that way down. Get some of that kind of same thing, right? Sounds a bit like the woman tone, right? I bring it up, it all comes back. Right? All right, so very inexpensive. 100 bucks? 129 bucks, 125 bucks, something like that. More expensive, is it worth it? I don't know, I like this pedal a lot. I like this pedal on its own. Let's just hear that for a minute. So here's my clean sound. I'm gonna turn this on. I love this pedal for that. Like I, I just, sometimes when I'm home uh, and I can't turn my amps up, I'll just play clean with the booty G on. up great so I think it's the sleeper of the Vemoram pedals kind of new it's not as popular as say the the Jan Ray or the Shanks but I, I love that pedal I think it's really especially great just plug it into an amp and then you it kind of answers the question as to why Michael Lando has one on his pedal board I think it's great now a word to you just so you guys know I am friends with the guys at Vemoram they sometimes give me pedals so all, you know, cards on the table. Uh, I'm friends with Emilio. I introduced him to Robin Ford. I bought that. I bought that. No, sorry, I bought that. I bought that. Um, these guys, I'm friends with Vemram and bought a number of my first pedals with them. And then I've helped them sell a bunch of pedals. <laughs> And they're great guys. So they're like, hey, let's just send you some, see what you think of it. So cards on the table. I think you guys hopefully nobody might know at this point. Um, I don't I don't talk about anything I don't like. I just don't. You know, I just don't think uh, 
every pedal that I use, it may not be on my board, but everything I'm put on the screen is something I really like. And I let you know which ones I've purchased and which ones I haven't. So just let you know, um, I have a relationship with Bam Ram. But um, that is a great sounding pedal. And I think it's a really nice boost. I think uh, the guys at Anderton's did it too. They kind of flipped out over it as well. All right, now all my Nashville friends love this one and the light speed, which uh, this one is really nice because what I think it already does, a lot of guys use it as an always on and we'll hear it both ways. Um, and then I'll hear it as a boost. So let's hear it as a boost, right? So here's my amp broken up. Now, everything's at noon. Fairly, fairly um, transparent. Which I really like about this pedal. I know the pedal show guys love it too. It's kind of putting a little bit more higher harmonics on top. Uh, I think it's a great pedal. It hasn't found a permanent place on my board because I've, I don't know, got other things I like as much and I'm not gonna sell this as I've sometimes sell some pedals I have. This is one of those ones, every time I plug in, I'm like, I'll find a place where I really love that. But a bunch of my friends really love it. Now let's hear the, crank up that gain a bit. So is anything, as we go through it, if you guys have any thoughts or something you want to hear, please put it in the chat. I mean, that's a great sound of pedal. And what I also look for in a lot of these pedals is, you guys have probably had, I think that the SD9, the, the, the um, it wasn't Ibanez, who was that? Maxon. Uh, I have the Vemram Landau butter machine, but I had the SD9 for years because I love Mike Landau and I love Scott Henderson, but I could never get that thing to work right for me. And many guys talk about that. And that's why Vemram put out th their version of it. And Scott Henderson's got his version of it. Because the tone knob was just really tweaky and not very useful. Um, the guy got, Mr. Greer, I forget his first name, really kind of got this great. <laughs> Right? So that's really pretty usable across the whole spectrum of it. So if I turn off just the gain on my amplifier, clean channel, that sounds awesome. So you see, look at the gain to the tone knob. A little too woolly right there, but check it out. That's a really great sound of pedals. Let's hear it next to the amp, the T-Rock. There's my T-Rock with gain on right now. So now if I do how I treat it on a gig, there's a T-Rock. So there's the lead boost or my second level of gain. So highly recommend any of these. So very easy to find, very inexpensive, very inexpensive, find reasonably priced, easy to find, more expensive. Um, the casing and you know all these things are, you know, Vemram's a premium company. Now the King of Tone is a great pedal, very reasonably priced, but very difficult to get. Um, I think he charges 325 for this now, which in the world of pedals is, Really great for, you know, a small company pedal and everybody, pretty legendary pedal. So let's check this one out. This is the higher gain version. So this is the blues breaker side. So that is boosting the amp here. Sorry, here's the amp on overdrive. Then I'm gonna hit the front end a bit harder. Now I can turn the drive down. Now here's an important thing too. There's a number of ways where we can gain stage the amplifier. Now, one thing is you can uh, push the front end of the amp really hard. So let's just do this. 
roll back the, dirt, the drive and turn up the volume. And then dial that up maybe more. Right? Or I can take the opposite approach and turn the drive up and set the gain accordingly. The upshot, they do two different things. So if you look at Eric Johnson's pedal board, I was always surprised when he used this tube driver. His volume is very, very low. So my understanding on this, and I, I do this as well depending on the gig, is I, the old school way, like when you have a tube screamer, would be to punch the front end of that amp really hard, but you get a huge volume boost. And that may be cool, you may want that, but sometimes you just get too much volume, right? So another thing you do depending on the pedal, and some pedals I find do this better than others, is I turn up the gain so I'm getting more gain into the front end of the amp and keeping the volume to where I'm just getting more overdrive but not a ton more volume. This is a really cool thing to think about because uh, the volume can be really difficult to deal with depending on the gig. Sometimes you want um, just more distortion. You don't want necessarily more volume. And there's a number of ways around that. I, I have on my other pedal board, which I'm doing a video on shortly, is a volume pedal to handle that. But sometimes, you kind of want the volume sort of similar to where the amplifier is. Or the other way, this way sometimes you get a little bit more articulation. So two ways to run it. If you could see the meters on my my computer here, when I hit the overdrive, it, it's hard because YouTube's going to compress it, but if you're sitting in front of a real amp, there'd be a noticeable difference in dB level for sure. Um, so that's something you got to think about. Uh, there's too much glare you can't read. Hey, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I've tried every way around it. These guys make um, shiny pedals. So... Um, Sorry, Steve. You're not getting your money's worth. <laughs> I tried. It's, um, it, I, it's, I've tried working through this. It's impossible. Do you see the, cam the, the, the light I have here? So, really simple, guys. Volume, drive, tone. Volume, drive, tone. And we'll get to that. Volume, volume, drive, tone. And in there, so. All right. So I can really tailor this give me more overdrive with less volume so there's two ways you can use all of these right so let's try that again so that kind of unity gain as best I can or That is much louder in terms of dB level, which, like I said, over YouTube is not going to show up as easily. All right, so here, if I'm not mistaken, it's a bit of a tube screamery side. Now you can tell right away the tube screamer has a much bigger pronounced mid hump and less low end. Uh, I know Mike has kind of tweaked it a little bit, I think, with him, Jim Weeder, to make it the way he. Like that, I don't own an actual tube screamer. I don't love actual tube screamers. So any tube screamers that I do own, this and the Duelist, which I'm happy to plug that in as well, are tube screamer variants, like stuff that they like, well, these are the things I didn't love about a tube screamer. Okay, so. So what this is already done, if we hear this, the tube screamer thing. Right, so that, it's glare. See, it's really hard to find, it's, it's impossible actually. So, here, I'm kind of, just try everything at Unity, or at Noon. So what it did,
kind of added some more of that poke of the mid forward. So let's hear that compared to the Klon idea. Let me try something here. Try this again. I've tried every route. Let's, I know you can see it just fine. But let's try something a little different. It's live. Tell me. You should see the setup I have. Is that better? No. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the, it's the silver on this thing. All right? So I'll talk to Emilio and say, dude, you can't do this to me. Let's see if I can put a, a rag over this. Hold on. Does that make any difference? Wait, hold on. <laughs> nope. Yeah, nothing I can do. It's it's like, I'm trying to do like this bolt. There we go. Nope. Anyway, all right. That's all I can do. All right, so it's a little better on the analog, man. Okay, so. We can kind of hear the difference and similarities. in the tube screamery kind of thing and over that and over there with the tumness. All right, so next up, I need an umbrella. Um, I have, you guys can't quite see, there is a massive light right here to get the, the lighting properly here. And it's, I don't, I'd have to have like a, yeah, I'm not a, not a production studio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now one of my other favorite pedals is the Gladio SC single channel. It's a really nice pedal, especially with strats. It's a bit um, like dumbly. All right, so. They all sound great, don't they? So, one thing I like about the Gladio is it is a bit more mid-rangey just due to the nature of the style of the pedal. This is a compression knob. I like it more, a compression button. I like it more open sounding than compressed. You can hear it. I turn off the amp. So you guys, so a lot of times you, you're gonna lose some volume with the compression down or up. And I don't really like that as much. It makes it a little more compressed, obviously. I like it more open sounding, so the switch downwards. It's a great pedal. All of these are great. And he has a clean knob dialed in here. All right, so here, once again, I think the reason why this pedal is so successful in my mind is it's not very bass heavy. It's more mid forward, like a dumble, where it's kind of going for the Robin Ford thing of a, uh, um, what's the tune? Uh, cannonball Shuffle. So it's very distinctive. I know Robin's got on his board or does on and off, and he's worked with Emilio with this pedal as well. And just go through the sweep of this. Once again, that's the tone knob. I'm going to bring it down. I'll bring it up. Hard to see, but I'm moving this. It's all very useful throughout the whole sweep of the pedal. So those are things that I look for for sure. How useful is the sweep on the, uh, the pedal? The tone knob, like I said, with the old SD9, it, it was so low, you have to the treble next almost off or the tone all the way off and it's really low down. And I always had a hard time with it. I always thought it sounded terrible. Um, so, and I'm not alone. Or I couldn't make it work. And then I'm like, oh, I kind of got it to work. And the next time it was not. And then it didn't have enough volume, which is the other thing that, that, that the, the pedal show does a great thing on that pedal. That sometimes the volume is just so, was so low. And then the, the butter machine that they put out from Mike Lando has a ton of volume, like huge amount of headroom. 
Um, okay, so the main thing I think as it goes through this, I think I warned you on the top of this, is I feel like I make all this stuff sound kind of the same. You guys agree? Like it's very, they're all good and they all have a little thing that I like about all of them. So the, the, the message here in many ways is really, really expensive overdrive pedals aren't necessarily that important. I think you got something like Tumnus, which is really inexpensive, super small. It's got that cool little buffer in it. You got something much more expensive like the Vemram. They sound different, but everything kind of just the way I work through this stuff right now, and I really feel comfortable with it. You know what I mean? Um, but the trick that I didn't know for many, many years, this is I've taught a million times, I'll say it again, is if you dial in the overdrive and your gain staging, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to the neck pickup of the guitar. Then go to your bridge and then you have a, hopefully a tone knob on your bridge pickup and you can start to dial in the tone that way. That to me is the classic way that most people I know do it. Um, Robin doesn't do it that way. He's like the anomaly on that. Most guys I know dial in the other way. Robin just just plays at a full volume amp and doesn't use his volume knob at all. So that's him. But other guys, like we talk about, uh, guys I mentioned, like Lando or Scott Henderson, they're using th that setup. Eric Johnson, pretty much every rock guitar player I know does the same thing for the same exact reasons. When you're playing on that neck pickup, you don't want everything to sound like, you know, sweet child of mine. All right. Um, yeah, so the, the person doing the playing um, is definitely the the main factor. Like I've said, that's why a lot of times I don't uh, do a lot of gear demos because I, I listen back and I'm like, oh, it just sounds like me. No matter what I play through, it sounds pretty much like, like me. If I play through a Vox, it sounds moderately different than me playing through a Marshall in many ways. So for me doing gear uh, demos, I'm like, well, okay, that I like this. I'm comfortable. So for me, it, it comes down to being comfortable and liking what it does. So what I don't like, which I think is just as important, I think these are things to think about too, is if there's not enough tonal options coming from the pedal, unless it just sounds great right away. Like you plug in like, yeah, it sounds awesome. Like uh, like the Vemram Clean Boost. All right, here's a Clean Boost. Not Vemram, sorry. Uh, uh, vertex. That's a great clean boost. So this sometimes I just use that. So there I'm using it as a gain staging. I'm hitting, um, you can't see it, sorry. <laughs> I can see it. There we go. So there I'm hitting the Vemram, sorry, Vertex. He makes a great boost pedal, pretty much a classic. And it's got a really nice buffer in it. I put that at the end so people say, well, we want to buffer it. So I really like that, but it's a different thing. So that's got no tonal change pretty much at all, which is really nice. Uh, there I was using it as a front end, pushing the front end of the amp. Very often if I'm on a gig and I have this, I might just have it running a clean amp. So I just use it to boost the whole volume of the pedal board. So I use it as a DB boost, but not a gain staging boost. Okay. Any questions so far, guys? Well, I was blabbing for a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, my wife's attorney warned me about the future of expenditure and overdrive pedals. Yeah, well, my point is many of these things, you don't need any new ones, sort of, you know. I don't, I look at, when I sometimes decide to buy one or I get another one, I'm like, awesome and then i realized that it's just i i don't want to say ultimately disappointed i'm just like oh it kind of does the same as all the other awesome overdrive pedals that i have that are out there right all right so any questions so far so i go back uh, angus clark yes he is a user of the tumnus so I bought a clone of the cot and didn't enjoy it all, at all. It's, you know, these are all things like you just got to experiment with one perfect. Like 
I had one for many, many years. Um, it's actually in the closet. Uh, the foot switch broke, and I just started using something else. And uh, then I got another one through a friend of mine bought it, and he was like, eh, and he went all digital. He's like, you want to want to buy this off me? So I, I picked it up from him for the price that he paid for it because he's my friend. So they're, they're, they just whatever floats your boat. You kind of start to know it, you know? Jason Carter, do you need to redial uh, when you change guitars? Sure. If I'm playing um, a humbucker, I'm going to have to tweak it differently, right? So you kind of try to think about that ahead of time. Uh, you're going to get much more compression from a humbucker probably, you know. Definitely much darker. That's a pretty bright strat though. An older string, sorry. So yeah, what I might have liked... And the strat might be a bit too beefy. So that I can start to tweak that accordingly. See right there, I just turned down, I turned up my treble a little bit and turned down the bass and I rolled back the gain a hair. I go to the neck. I like that. Now that's a bit, you know, woman Tony, which I really like. But say you don't want that, so what I'm going to maybe do is maybe bring back some of the gain, bring back some of that bass. See, that's what I like. So that to me is subtracting on the bass, and I can maybe turn up the gain and adding a hair of treble. But I'm always trying to make a neck pickup on a Les Paul or a humbucker sound like a Strat, because just that's the sound I want. So now, Of the bridge. I can dial that tone up if I want. That's pretty gamey. So there I'm turning down the gain and turning up the volume. Pretty cool. Um, if you had to pick any two of these in the board, which this is from Angus. Um, geez, man. Uh, maybe this one. Maybe the Vemram, because I'm just kind of digging on it lately. I love the King of Tone because it's two and one, kind of not fair. You know, we can gain stage these two. Um, so digging both. Uh, digging, I think all these, man, they've all been on my board at some point. I gotta say with the Strat, there's something magic about the, the Cornerstone, the Gladio, I really love it. So how's that for an answer? Um, right, so the gig I'm playing with Matt Schofield at the bitter end uh, next Thursday, next Wednesday night in New York City uh, on the 24th at 9.30 p.m. playing with Matt Schofield. Um, I'm gonna probably just go super simple because my other bigger board isn't really, I don't need it for that gig so I'm not doing a lot of effecty things. Um, I'm gonna probably bring uh, the Jan Ray and maybe um, the King of Tone or something like that. So I'm going to use the, this two rock that I have with the amp overdrive and then just push the front of the amp, under the amp. Maybe the light speed, I don't know, they all sound good. Here's also the trick, when you get to a gig, then sometimes you really start to figure out the ones that you really, really like or turn it up at volume. Um, yeah, don't buy them all at once. You know, because it's like anything. You buy too many things at once, you don't you don't even know which one you like. Um, but man, you know, for for like easy to find, no no loser, like no chance of not probably liking it. In my mind, it's gonna probably be the, the you know light speed or the the tumness. You want some really inexpensive. The tumness is just super great. Um. I've been on the cot list for five years and seven months. 
Wow. It's five years long, the waiting list. It is. That's true. That's crazy. I hope you like it when you get it. I think it's great. There's so many good overdrive pedals out there. I mean, there's so many. Um, it's, it's hard to say which ones are better than others. I don't think, like there's so many good ones. I, I think that it, it, it's just a matter of messing around and finding the one that you like yourself, you know, the most. All right, so let's talk a little bit about gain staging. So what we're really kind of doing here in the perfect pedal for that right now, So what I'm going to do here, I have overdrive coming from the amplifier. Sort of. Same-ish volume, but more gain. Now if I want to hit that louder. And so by, I'm going to stack on top of these, these two, so it's a three stages into one amp. So it's gain staging. Uh, one of the most common ways I like to gain stage is, say we do the same idea. I'm going to put more gain here. And then... So what I did, once again, is I set this to just be a little bit more overdrive onto the amplifier, not more volume. So I'm just beefing up the overdriven sound so I can get just a heavier guitar tone. And then I might crank this. This is output volume wise is pretty high. It's pretty hot. And then that gives me more of a volume boost as well. So I've got this three stage thing, the initial amp overdrive. I'm going to put this other gain in front of it to get more distortion not necessarily more volume. And then I might hit another pedal over here where I might actually just push the volume a bit more, maybe a little less distortion. That can all change the articulation on the way your overdrive sounds. And sometimes it sounds better on certain pedals to crank up the volume and keep the gain down. And I've also found some other pedals sound better when I crank up the gain and keep the volume somewhat lower. So you want to experiment with both because both are really cool. So an overdrive pedal or a distortion pedal can all function as a boost pedal as well. Some of them are dedicated boost pedals, say like the, uh, the Vertex is just a clean boost. But say something like the Lightspeed can be sort of a clean boost or an overdrive pedal on its own or a boost pedal. It could be any of those. So any of these other ones could be any of those three. The only one I don't like as an overdrive standalone is the Klon circuit. Let me show you why. So, let me switch back to the Strat. Because those strings are old. And these are not. All right, so here's the amp clean. I mean, it sounds good, but it's very mid-rangey. I'd rather have something like this. which is almost feels like more of my, or my, my amp with just overdrive on it. I think this pedal does that really, really well. And so does the, the light speed. They don't color too much, which I think is awesome. So I like that a lot because it just sounds like my amp bigger or with overdrive. When I use a Klon style circuit, I, this is when I first got a Klon many, many years ago. I'm like, I don't get it. Cause I was using it as like an overdrive pedal, not a boost pedal. And I finally figured out like, oh, it's supposed to go into the, the front of, a, of an already overdriven amp. See what I did there? And as before, it was a little woofy. Turned up the treble. By just turning that treble, where is that? 
the treble just a hair do you hear like it it got rid of some of that low end and it tightened it up let's hear that again <laughs> See how little I moved that treble knob? So that to me is the stuff that you really have to take the time thinking about doing because, uh, you know, that's, that's some pretty fine stuff going on. But that's what you gotta do. It can just be that little thing like, oh man, it's so close. What's up? I'm gonna go boop, and just turn that here and it really comes together. All right, any questions or anybody? Oh, explaining this to a non-guitar player might make them think we're insane. Oh, absolutely. This is um, all ridiculous stuff. It's just like when somebody starts explaining to you some, well, anything like this, wine or, or a video game or something, you're like, I'm not, really? It all sounds the same to me. But this is the fun of it. And this is what, you know, this is why we have a bunch of people walking on here, uh, watching on here with me. Um, does the light speed give your great woman tone? Okay, the, the woman tone for me is not from the overdrive pedal, it's from your tone knob. So, right? Um, so, that's, let's turn my tone knob down. Right? Right, so that, I'm just turning my tone knob down on my neck to pick up, and that gives me the woman tone. Sounds cooler with, uh, with humbuckers. Um, any thoughts on underdriving with pedals? I've, I've not really done that much. I usually just use the volume knob on my guitar. A trick that a lot of people like is you can have, you can drop the volume on your amp. You know? You know, by using the overdrive pedal in many ways. Let's try the overdrive. Right? But to me, sometimes that that's is very that's backwards, and my my mind would be like, wait, I got to step on that to drop the volume. I don't know how. Uh, I would have to get used to that, so I'd go the other way. Um, but. That's kind of the idea. So now, just real fast, if I change one, let's um, let's just take out. Oop, let's just take this out. I'll plug in the Ben Ram as an overdrive pedal. Where's this going? All right, the input. Someone's gonna say, "Well, you took out the buffer. Everything's gonna sound different." It's a clean amp. It's a great sound of pedal. So now, a little more pronounced in there, admit. Let's try the light speed. Sounds great. So they're all. That one's got a little bit more of that mid poke, which is great. And 
another reason why I don't do pedal demos um, is uh, <laughs> I end up playing the same thing on demos. You know, I'm more of a playing in improv sense. So doing demos in those, you know, the the blues the guitar licks. Sometimes I'm like, ah, oh. I listen back to these. I'm like, yeah, I played the same thing in every video, but whatever. Um, For my old, uh, blah, 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 overdrive more. So, yeah. uh, I love overdrive on the January, but I find it darkens my sound significantly, even when adjusting the bass and treble. Any tips? Um, is there anything on here? That's that's gain on there. Um, no. <laughs> I wish I had an idea. Like, so if you're finding it's still too dark, maybe it's just, maybe it's just not the pedal for you, right? And your amp situation so there are just some pedals that you're like yeah this, this doesn't sound great with this amp this one sounds great with that amp i, I found that that's a big thing um i haven't gigged out with the jan ray yet uh i usually gig out with the shanks which i have on the floor on my other board uh the vam the vam ram shanks which i think is great supposedly it's like a nobles kind of thing um i, I wish i had a better thing for you because I, I don't want people start saying like oh well you can get a EQ pedal. I have an EQ pedal. I don't want to use an EQ pedal on my pedal board. I know a lot of people love it. I just want to find the pedals that do that. And that's pedal board space. And then I'm sitting there. Then I'm going to start OCDing about a EQ on my pedal board. I'd rather have it just from the pedal. So if it's, if the Gen Ray is not really fitting your bill, then I would maybe, maybe try something else. It might be great for another amp. Um, do you have a heavy guitar? Uh, w what do you mean? Like, like a hard rock guitar. Um, I, this is my Les Pauls, I guess. I do have a Jakey e. Lee Charvel, which I love, but the neck is too thin for me and it makes my hands hurt. But uh, no, if I'm doing anything heavy, you know, there's there's no better guitar in my mind for heavy stuff than a, a good Les Paul. Just crank up the gain on it. So uh, I don't really play that much heavy stuff, but even when I did, it was just a Charvel with like a regular normal output pickup. I never really liked high gain pickups or high output pickups. I just think you lose the sound of the guitar. Um, but I'm a Strat guy, ultimately. Just love Strats. Um, I have found when I do, when I use a humbucker on gigs, uh, on my gig, I, I, I kind of always regret it. I love Les Pauls, but sometimes I find on, I'm just so used to Strats and, and humbuckers compress a lot. Even if I dial off the they compress more than single coils. So I'm used to single coils. So that's for me. I'm always using the single coils. Do you have a compressor on your board at all? It keeps your volume um, relative uh, when gain staging. I don't like compressors. I've never gotten along with them. Um, the only time I like them, I just contradict myself, is uh, when I'm playing slide guitar, which doesn't really happen that much. Uh, I had a few discussions. I'm friends with Sonny Landris, and I was like, "Well, man, do you do you, do you always use a compressor?" He's like, it's "Never off." Like when he's playing slide, this, the compressor is never off. It's a big part of the sound. Really, really be a big part of the sound. Um, little George. Most guys I know, if they're not playing to a crank amp, is going to be using a compressor. Um, I find compressors just ruin my dynamics. And I work really hard at playing dynamically. And it's like noise gates kill me when I hear noise gate. Like I just, I have to, if I have a noise gate on something, it has to be on super, super, super low because I play dynamically and a lot hear it cut off that note. And compressors, in my experience, I've never really found a place that I like them because they mess with my dynamics. And I know that's kind of the, the point to keep, right? You're saying to keep volumes relative when gain is when gain staging. I don't, I don't want that because then it also quashes it. I know you can sit there and dial it in, but every time I've tried to dial it in, I felt like this isn't working for me. Now, of course, compressors in a studio compressor, adding it after you've cut your guitar tracks and in the recording, that's a different thing. But right off the bat, I'm not really um, uh, into them for that reason. Same reason, as much as I love humbuckers for certain things, they kind of do a bit of the same thing to me. Now, I know a lot of people argue that. There's some guys who get great dynamics with humbuckers. I, I'm just a single coil guy, ultimately. I just find my most at home with them. I find they're more interactive. Uh, I love P90s for that reason. Um, 
but strats are just home base. And when I when I play guitars with humbuckers, I use them for particular things. Um, I could have used this video in 1987. I wanted a VH style tone and had an 80s rat. Oh man, I uh, it didn't sound um, it didn't sound like I was expecting. I didn't know how to tweak and what to expect. I threw it away, dumbass. I same with you, man. I had a rat. I'm like, why is it supposed to sound good? I had no idea about any of this stuff. And then the whole rack gear came along in the 80s and 90s, um, and it's just you know. That was that other road to go down. I had the Marshall JMP-1. I had the predecessor of that, which was terrible. And then JMP-1, which is cool. And then some of my friends had the ADA, the MP-1, JMP-1, no, the MP-1, which um, I never never really loved the sound of. And Angus is still here. He had the JMP-1 as well. I thought that was great sounding. And Billy Gibbons to uses it. Uh, it's pretty cool. It had a thing. And interestingly enough, if you guys have S gear, you know, Scuffum Amps, F gear, he, S gear, that plugin, he designed that. Um, he designed that uh, that amp of the JMP1. Um, do you still have any old rack gear? I don't. Sold all of it. Um, you know, a bunch of things. The older I get, the less I want to move stuff. So racks were just uh a lot and as you, you know a hundred pounds of shit in a 500 pound bag you know <laughs> or something like, that. like if you listen to like a, one of the great guitar players of all time steve lucas or if you go back and listen to some of those like his reh video where he plays great and they've got this huge rack or larry carlton larry carlton larry Car and he's playing he's got this huge rack of stuff and you'll be like they sound better in my mind now when they're just kind of plugged into the amp and not dealing with all the rack stuff. I think it really, really, in retrospect, some of those 80s tones uh, are very thin. Um, not talking about the playing. I'm talking about some of those tones, and I don't love them anymore. I did at the time, and now, now you play it, and you're like, oof. And a lot of those guys feel that way now, too, which is kind of funny. Do you like to play tellies at all? Middle pickups bothers... Um, Middle pickup bothers my picking hand and strat. I, I have a, I, I've got two tellies. Well, one, I've got one, really, one from Michael Tuttle, which is great. I got this cool thing on loan from Watchtower right now. This Jeff Beck Esquire thing. Uh, you know, one of those master built one of a hundred. This is a great guitar. It's like weighs nothing, but it's um, it's a collector's thing. I just got it for fun. Or let me check it out. I'm gonna do a video on it. I, I love tellies. Um, I just can't. Just everything is wrong for me. <laughs> I need the I need the, the tone knob right here. Now nothing really built beats a telly bridge pickup. I have to admit that. You know when you just when you plug one in. Um, it's a thing, especially when there's no volume knob on it. And it's in tune. Wasn't expecting to play it. And older strings. Normally it'd be a bit bitier. And obviously this is a uh, an Esquire. But it is a good guitar. Um, okay, the reason why I don't play them that much is I just grew up playing strats. I do like them. I feel, mo I feel very comfortable on a Telecaster. Um, I just... Uh, I'm used to, I like having a tremolo quite a bit, and I also am just used to the, the location. I am much more comfortable on Telecasters than I am on Les Pauls, though. Love Les Pauls, but I still find myself doing dumb stuff like turning up, changing the pickup, and I have the volumes are different. And I like mixing the volume knobs, but on a gig, I find that to be problematic for me. Um, or like, yeah, you, you could lower the middle pickup on the Strat. My friend Angus, if he's still here, he does that. Richie Blackmore, Ingvay Malmsteen style. A lot of those guys do that. So it's kind of like a telly strat. You're just never using that middle thing. Um, what is your desert island rig? Uh, I, I mean, I really love any of these amps. Uh, a two rock, I find to be a really special amps. I really love them. Uh, I would want something of reverb, because I like reverb. So two rock Bloomfield Drive with a classic reverb signature. 
Super Reverb's great. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a bit more of a Marshall guy, but if there's just like, if I just had one amp, it would be something with a reverb. Um, but uh, a Plexi, I just love, JTM 45s, I love all those. Um, and in terms of guitars, it would be a Strat, one of my Strats. And uh, a oh, reverb, a delay pedal, I love having a little bit of delay. And just an overdrive, just, it doesn't need to be a ton. The kind of the older I get, the less gamey I like to play. So something kind of simple and a tuner. <sighs> um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. I call a great line from Tim Lurch that whenever you use picker fingers, that's your first gain stage. Yeah. So I, when I was talking about a two rock or any of these things, the two rock it's they're really, any really good amp is going to be sensitive to the way you play. I don't want to use anything that is going to remove any of the sensitivity or the gain, the dynamics that I've worked hard to create as a guitar player. So when you talk about things like compressors, that things that remove, um, remove dynamics. So I try to avoid those. So like super, super gaining amps. I love playing super gain stuff. It's fun for a minute or two, or I really enjoy it and it's fun. Like, yeah, this is fun. And then after a little while, I'm like, oh, it's, I just need something more dynamic. I need to hear a bit of an interaction between me and the instrument. Uh, yeah, it all comes back down to home base, doesn't it? This is from uh, Kurt Schaffenberg. Uh, I feel the same way about Les Paul. It's kind of my safe space, go figure. It's absolutely just what you started with. I was having this discussion with my friend Matt uh, at, over at 30th Street. And it, it still comes down to, I think, what you kind of grew up on. I grew up on playing Charvels, which were usually like single, single humbucker. And I just naturally got some Stratocasters. And then when I started getting into Les Pauls, when I started like kind of just going that route, which I love, but um, I just feel like the Strat for me is the home base and Especially, I think it can cover a little more ground if you're playing things like funkier gigs or Strat just, I feel like it can cover all the grounds where I feel like a Les Paul could be a little too big sounding. But there's plenty of guys who can prove me wrong in that. But um, And all my friends who are Telly guys are like, no, Telly's the best guitar ever. And I get the point that they're saying because that bridge pickup's the awesome you have to worry about tuning differences or anything like that. I get it. And after seeing guys like, um, uh, oh man, name just popped out of my head. California guitar player, really great. Uh, Alan Hines, yeah, I saw him play live in LA and just using an Esquire. So when you hear a guy who's really a master at that or someone who's really great at playing a junior with one pickup, I didn't miss any other pickups. So it's whatever you, kind of grew up on and spent some time on but for me it's always going to be a Fender or a Fender-esque kind of guitar whether it's by my friend Michael or any Michael Tuttle it's just a Fender kind of guitar is, is the home base for me so hopefully this was helpful on the, the pedals to do the rundown again is when I use an overdrive pedal I'm often using it if I'm using it in gain stage, I want an overdrive pedal that will allow me to shave off a little bit of low end. That's usually what gets us into trouble is too much low end. It's like if you turn up a Fender, like a, I remember when I've got my first uh, Deluxe Reverb that I certainly regret selling because it was like a 64 and I sold it, whatever. Things you do because you don't know. And I remember cranking it up and I'm like, why does this sound terrible? And I find like, oh, you got to turn the bass down. Unlike some old, like a, Marshall, like unlike a 800 where there's not a lot of low end, so you could turn that bass up. So the louder you get, you got to turn the low end down on a Fender. Same thing with like a two rock, and there can be a lot of low end in it. Um, so this is the same exact idea when you're using an overdrive pedal, especially as a in a boost situation. I always look for something that can dial back some of that low end or maybe add some high end. So it could be something. Uh, just let me go back to this as as simple as a light speed or this is like a clon thing. Someone just got a really good dialed in tone knob. Uh, pretty transparent, one of the most transparent ones. So is this. I would not call this transparent, but I like what it does. I def I wouldn't call the cornerstone necessarily 
ultimately transparent, but it's very pleasant, and I really like what it does, especially for boosts and solos. It helps me cut through. This thing sounds great. I haven't used it much, but uh, you know, the tube screamery, and that's a blues breaker. Two really great pedals. All of them do great stuff. I mean, I can dial this in as a boost. That's my Vamram off camera. The Janray. But all of those have enough tonal options or tonal control that I can start to dial it in. I'll also dial in everything for the neck pickup. Usually I have a bridge pickup that has a tone knob on it, and I'll just take it from there. And if I'm going to use it as a standalone overdrive, depending on my amplifier, if I'm using something good like a two rock clean, I just kind of want it to sound like a two rock with a bit of bite to it. I found that these two of what's on my board right now do that really, really well. Like this sounds like you're just your same amp sort of overdriven. This does too. This gives you a bit more tonal options. Um, this will color your tone a bit, which is cool in a good way. Uh, that colors a bit, but these two right here I found to be super natural sounding, and um, I don't use that as a, I don't use a Klon circuit as a standalone overdrive because I just don't love the way that it sounds. Um, what do I think of the PRS Silver Sky? I think they're great. Um, I don't have one. Um, and I work with PRS. You guys know that I'm friends with the guys over there. Uh, I, when we first started working, like, what oh, would you like to check out a, a Silver Sky? And I've played them. I think they're great. Uh, I, I like strats, you know, like my friend, Michael Tuttle makes me great guitars. I love his, or I just like that, you know, a strat it's aesthetically. It's a bit more, it's strat. Uh, the, the Silver Skies I think are great. Um, if you're talking, I've said this a million times, if you're talking like an off the rack strat, just American standard and the equivalent of that, the, the, the Silver Sky is, I'm almost gonna say undoubtedly a better constructed guitar in my experience. I've been to the PRS factory and they take it really seriously. And that's really impressive when you go there and they're really on top of that stuff, the quality control, it going out set up well, all those things. Um, whereas, Stuff in the Fender stuff, even the custom shop, I've seen things where you're like, really? I've got guitar repair fans who are like, yeah, they send out guitars that are completely not set up or intonated, all this crazy stuff, the stuff they get them out. Um, but, you know, I, but the Silver Sky is great. If you, yeah. I like, okay, this is from John Smith. I like the ergonomics of a strap, but not the pickups. It's not vintage, uh, it's not vintage, so felt okay about modding it now. Now it has too many humbuckers and things. Yeah, you know, this is the great stuff. You just make it what you want it to be. Who cares? Like it's your it's your guitar. You have fun with it. You know, it's like playing something that's fake relic. I mean, if you like it, cool. Whatever. You know what I mean? Who cares? Do you have an ES three thirty five? I did, and I traded my three thirty five. I had a Murphy Lab, and I traded it towards my sixty eight Strat, which is getting worked on. That's why it hasn't made an appearance today. Which is one of my favorite Strats, but it's getting worked on. Uh, I love three thirty fives fell into the same category of, um, I don't do enough, I don't know any session work. So the 335 and the, the Les Paul recording wise, I can get them to be, they fill the same general space. 335 guys, Gibson guys be like, no, no, it doesn't. But for me, it does, you know, it's got the humbucker thing. So um, the thing, also thing about 335s, and, and me is traveling. They're, they require a bigger gig bag. They definitely, if you're gonna go on the road, they require a much bigger flight case, all those things. So when I'm going to Europe, um, I'm just taking a, take a Fender style guitar or something with a bolt on neck, fairly indestructible, uh, unlike a Gibson style guitar. And then if you got a flight case for a 335, uh, they're big. Especially if you get one like, um, I really like those i the i series by let's say Gator who makes the i series um, cases really good. I have one for my Les Paul. I got one for a three thirty five that I had for a while, and it was just it was just too big. It was way too much for me to deal with. I didn't I didn't want to deal with it. Um, so Telecasters or Stratocasters Stratocasters would be on the road because my also my music. I'm so used to playing Strats, but I mean I could get used to this thing. It's a really good guitar. And also it's already routed for a, another pickup as all S cars are. So you just change the pick card and put in another pickup. 
if you want. All right. Um, so we got through another great live stream, Mr. Macron. Thanks, Michael Cope. Thanks, my friend, as always. Um, if I want to set a humbucker on the bridge of my strat, do you think it's going to need an additional OD pedal for that bridge pickup? No. I, well, I have... Well, I got no place to be. Hold on one second, guys. It's raining. You know, I have that. Because of course I do. Um, this is my friend Michael Tuttle. I don't know if it's in tune. Nope. Hold on. You get my tuner. Um, it's interesting, when I put in humbuckers in a strat, I still try to even everything out a bit. I don't want a humbucker that's gonna be like twice the output of the single coil. So I really try to match them up a little bit more. Come on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I don't want it to be like, I switch to the humbucker and then suddenly it's twice the volume. That feels weird to me. The humbucker in the bridge, You know, you get the, if you don't have any, the quiet system, it keeps it quiet. So, that's nice. Right? The quiet, but if you noticed, I've tried to match them out as best I can. So the difference in the humbucker and the bridge, though. I almost forget how good this guitar is. Um, the humbucker and the bridge, I just like the way it sounds. It's a little different than a single coil, which is going to be a little bitier. Uh, I'm just so used to single coils in the bridge. Uh, I have that Michael Landau Strat with his two humbuckers. It's a Strat with two humbuckers. I sometimes still struggle a little bit with that neck pickup as a humbucker and a Strat. Sounds great. Ron Ellis puts, got maybe some great pickups for it, but something I kind of go back and forth with. Um, I have the Analog Man by Chorus pedal, and it's a great pedal. All of Analog Man stuff's really great. Great dude, too. Um, would you agree that drive distortion compresses the tone? It seems to me like the heavier distortion, the smaller tone, hence why metal guys feel the need to tune down and sound, to sound heavy. Um, yeah, well, any gain staging is going to compress the tone, for sure. So I'm looking for, I'm looking for something um, the more the more gainy stuff you got to do, the more you compress. So when I use a more gainy tone, I'm expecting it to compress, and I'm trying to take advantage of the stuff that you get from a lot of compression. Like if I want a legato something, you know, like do a fast legato thing that benefits from maybe a little bit more overdrive and compression, that's when I'm going to kick that stuff in. So if I'm saying I'm going to solo, I'm going to use lower gain, maybe step on that first thing, and then if I want to get that super over the top, a lot of sustain, and I'm not playing as dynamically, though the dynamic is high, that's when I'll step on that higher gain stage where things will compress more, and then I'll get that sustain, I'll get the reverb, all those things that I want. But I don't want that all the time, because that, if I, look. So if you can like, you know, get this kind of, I have these two on, and the amp. Like, I have to, even I turn my volume down, watch. Doesn't do much because there's so much gain and so much compression, but watch. Right, so just by... Yeah, you lose all the dynamics when you're super stacking, but what you get when you do that... You know,
you get some of those things that you can't quite get the same experience with when you don't have that much gain and compression. But yeah, um, the louder I play, the less gain I like. I listen to a lot of, like you listen to Van Halen, especially in the early days, he wasn't using that much overdrive. Huge sound. Um, I took my Silver Sky SE, sanded the neck to match my custom 24, tossed a JB Jr. in the bridge. Cool, man. That's awesome. Um, hey, Bill Shokaitis, thanks so much for the top chat here. Appreciate that. Uh, lunch on me tomorrow. Thank you very much. Finally caught a live stream. My mind is blown from the last lesson. <laughs> cool, man. I think we did. Uh, can't remember what we did. What did we talk about the last time? Do I have a favorite overdrive to pair with a Vox style amp? That's a great question, and I don't. And the reason why is I never play Voxes. Um, there's a few reasons why I don't play Voxes. The, the main one is I don't own one. <laughs> Secondly, um, I love Voxes on gigs, but at home, Voxes are very, uh, there's not a lot of low end, a lot of very mid range and upper sound, upper treble in, the, in a Vox, which sounds really great in the context of a band. At home, for me playing, I it's a little, I like a little bit of a warmer, fuller sound. So, um, never really gotten into boxes. Also, AC thirties are just too big and heavy. I'm not carrying that thing around. I love the way they sound in context of bands, but they're just too big and heavy. Um, I don't want to say those days are over. Those days are over because one, I just don't have the hands to move that stuff anymore. Uh, Two, I don't want to move that stuff. Three, I want to, or one, I don't have the hands. Two, I don't want to move that stuff. Three, there's no place where you can use that anymore. At least in the gigs that I'm using, you know, like I've got this tour coming up and um, I don't know, I'm still contemplating using a fractal just because it's easier, you know, fractal and a powered monitor because it can sound great. Would I like to use my a two rock? Yeah, but then I got to, I'd, I'd, you know, if you, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get over there. So with the Fractal, which a lot of guys are using, considering it because it's it's lighter and easier. Luis Castro, thank you for the the top chat, man. Thanks so much. Awesome live stream. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm probably a little meandery because I'm just, I do wing a lot of these, as you could probably tell. Um, I think it's more fun than me like reading off of some sort of script on a live stream. And hopefully you guys got something out of this and had fun nerding out on different pedals. So if I go, I'm going to repeat myself and I'll go back to this. You don't need to spend a ton of money on the unobtainium overdrive. Is a Klon a great pedal? Yeah. It's, it's just a circuit. There are tons of great Klon clones. I, so I traded my Klon for one of my favorite guitars. So to me, that was worth it. Don't even look back. I mean, there's a little bit of like, you know, bragging, yeah, I got a Klon, an original one. Yeah, but I don't want to bring an original Klon onto the gigs that I end up doing, you know, playing in a the 50, no, not 55 bar, Oop, brain, just jump back 10 years, 15 years, uh, like the bitter end. You know, not that I don't trust it. It's, it's generally cool, but yeah, somebody can steal this ridiculously expensive pedal. Some point that foot switch might break, who knows? And then... I have a KTR at AB the two. It sounds pretty much identical. I played the Tumnus. It's a little different, but how much different? You go watch the Andersons videos where they do all those shootouts and the the Tumnus. I'm pointing, and the Tumnus just you know it's indistinguishable largely from a Klon. So that's the first thing. Um, of all these, I I can highly recommend any of these. Um, and they all do something a little different, and yet they all do sort of the same thing. A uh, little more, I like this one. It's the most, these two are the most, sounds like my amp, pretty much unadulterated. I like these two a lot. Uh, King of Tones is classic, great sounding pedal. I love that. I, I like the Cornerstone Gladio quite a bit for what it does, especially with strats. I like it with humbuckers, love it with strats. Um, and the Tumnus for me, once again, if you want a Klon, just buy one of these, you know. There are other great versions of this, of the Klon, like the Aria, or Ira, Ira, there's that. There's the Mythos one, which is awesome. They're all more expensive and, you know, it's tiny and it sounds great. And uh, 
you know, if you lose it, let's get another one. So, um, okay, it's a great point. This is uh, Jose Daniel Zamora, and he's from um, from Argentina. Thanks for checking out, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I heard um, an Argentinian, Argentinian player says that he prefers modelers due to the consistency um, and the e like the happy, happiness of not carrying heavy amps. Yes, this is one of the things that make them so cool. And if you check out my friend Angus Clark, he's got his a video on putting out these. He does a lot of flight dates and he uses a fractal for that reason. They've gotten so good. The latest firmware from fractal, all of them have gotten good. Uh, the latest firmware from fractal. You always think, well, can this stuff get any better? And then you listen to it and you go, yeah, it sounds even better. I might go that route because, yeah, moving, carrying amps around, um, also renting amps, it kind of sound the same every night. Volume control is a huge thing on gigs. And when I'm, I've talked about this a million times, but I've been to some of the gigs that we play in, in Europe, some could be you know, theaters, which are amazing. It's great. And then sometimes those theaters are designed for like opera, an old house. And then suddenly you're like, Pah! blare in this. And it's just not, it's just not appropriate. I want to play for the volume of the music. I have no interest in playing super loud and, and making people upset. Also, some of the rooms we play on this, some towns are very small rooms. And I like a lot of times the small room. I like those intimate uh, surroundings. And then if something with a hot rod DeVille, you're still sitting there trying to find, you know, what's going on and trying to find that spot. So I might just go make my life easier and just use the fractal, which I think sounds great. Mike Gamby, um, make sure you grab that Fender FRFR. I'm on, I'm trying to figure out, because I don't have one here in, at home, trying to figure out which one's going to be the one. There's a bunch of them out there. Oh, the, okay, what is an FRFR? It's a flat response speaker. I'm not sure I got the, the uh, anagram right or whatever that word is. Palindrome. Not lob. Bolton spelled backwards is not lob. Somebody's got to know what I'm talking about there. Um, oh, yes. Okay. And he also says that roadies and sound engineers treat him better now. Yeah, the sound guys love it when you don't, when you're running. I just can't deal with the silent stage, like the kind of music if, you know, that's just weird. I, I have to have volume on the stage. So what a flat response speaker is, what we're talking about here is um, when I play... Right now I'm playing through my aux and it's coming through my studio monitors or when I play through my fractal, it comes to the studio monitors. So it's very different experience than the amp in the room. So basically if you plug in a fractal or a, an amp sim, a big part of the sound is what we call the IR, which is the impulse response, which is the speaker emulation. You're emulating a certain speaker, speaker cabinet and microphone or microphone combination. That's a big part of the sound of your amplifier. If you change speakers in your amplifier, it's going to sound very different. If you're using like vintage 30s and then you switch to like a Greenback or T12H or something like that, it's going to sound very different. And that's a huge thing. People say, before you get a new amp, change the speaker. So the interesting thing or the difficult thing that I'm not, for me, is I have not experimented with the flat response speaker. So that's basically a, a guitar, it's like a PA speaker that's, Base, it's like a PA speaker for your fractal and you're just there's got no coloration so what's coming out of that it's a guitar speaker colors your tone a guitar speaker is like an EQ so essentially they're trying to be like a non EQ speaker flat response and there's a few of them out there that are popular now, fenders put one out that looks kind of like a fender amp I kind of like that and it's got some tone knobs on the top so you can adjust it there's another one that I'm looking at. I know the guys over Fractal a little bit, and they have the Red Sound one, which is, and it, it's like 15, 20 pounds, and it's like this big, and they're loud as all get out. I'm not playing a big rock and roll show where I need the big Marshall or two rock behind me. I just want something that's going to sound good. The real thing that's making me think about going in terms in the Fractal route is I'm the only guitar player. If there were another guitar player and he were playing through an amplifier, on stage, there's no way I would play through a, a modeler. Net in a million years. That's like, that's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It's just you just gotta get your your butt handed to you. It just I've never seen a situation where someone's using a modeler and someone's using a real amp, and the guy using the real amp doesn't just completely sonically destroy the guy using the modeler. 
the reason for that is just a tube amp at, at volume on a stage. Like it's just its own glorious thing. If there's only me on guitar and I'm playing with a keyboard player who's largely going direct and a bass player who's going through PA and amp, but through a direct box, like that is that will be fine because the guitar is still gonna sound good and I'll have a lot more control over the volume at any situation, any point in time. It's definitely a change though, because you, you, there is a learning curve to getting the EQs to these things right. So it's not like a plug in and place. So that's what makes me a little nervous. But I think the fractal stuff sounds amazing. You guys have heard it a lot. If you watch any of my videos, um, most of it's the fractal. It's just really easy. I leave it on all day and then get any sounds and every sound that I want out of it. So I'm really, really happy with, with fractal. Um, so yeah, that's something I would, I'm considering for all those reasons. Um, can you push enough air through a model or through a speaker? Yeah. I mean, boy, some of those, um, yeah, they can get ton really, really loud. And I'm not really, one of the reasons why I just don't want to do all in-ears is there's no stage volume. And I like the interaction between you and a speaker. You can get some feedback. You can get all those awesome things that you can get from guitar. Um, but a friend of mine, check out his page. He's in Italy, Marco Fantone. And Marco does a lot of stuff for Fractal and he helped him design those speakers. I've been back and forth with him. He's like, man, the eight inch speaker one that's this big, if you want, you can run a stereo. He's like, it's huge, it's really loud. And it allows you to run, uh, power the other speaker if you want to go stereo. And then it sends another line to the front of the house. So it solves a lot of problems. So, um, Guitar has changed a lot. I mean, only time I've ever been able to play, or when I play at the bitter end with Matt, he's loud. So that's a real volume gig. Anytime I did those gigs with Robin, that was really loud. Um, too loud for me, honestly. I, I used to try to keep up with him and I was like, I can't keep up with him. So earplugs in and just trying to angle myself on stage where I wasn't getting Robin's dumble right at my head. Um, and I'm not, I mean, that it's, it's just, it's, I'm not used to playing that loud. It was weird having to play that loud. I like playing with some volume, but that was, that was other, that was another level of loud um, that he's used to. But so I had to work around it. So I just want it to be loud enough where it's compelling. So yeah, any of these flat response speakers can totally do that. Um, and, you know, you could probably get that volume. You can get the sounds that you want at any volume, which is the big deal uh, with with the fractal stuff. Uh, we're our own sound guys. Like, you know, it's not a different room each night, different. It's the same PA. We travel the same PA, but it, the last tour, it was a bit problematic at times um, where I couldn't get the amp loud enough to do what I wanted it to do. And I'm putting things in front of the amplifier, like a pedal board or turning the amp around or all these things. So I'm thinking about it. I mean, I might be able to get a two rock in the road. If I can get that, I might try that again. You know, let's try that and maybe buy some baffles. But a bit more that I'm thinking about it since the, like I said, the, the huge change in the kind of room and size we play, it, it might go the other way. And I know the, I know the guys would be really happy with me because I've talked about this before. Some of those guys are a bit more from the jazz world and I came there and they were like, holy crap, man, that's loud. I'm like, no, this ain't loud. This isn't loud. You haven't played loud. This is, you know, um, so I, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike Gamby, as soon as I got feedback from the Fender FFR, I was like, okay, it's a keeper. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I just need it to feel like I'm playing through an amp to a certain extent. It's probably never going to feel exactly like all the things that I'd want from a real amp. But with that comes volume, just this volume and the world has changed quite a bit when it comes to these things. I also want to be asked back to some of these clubs. If they're like, man, that guy's just too freaking loud. You know, okay, for another example, I'll keep on talking here, but people are hanging. We did a gig one night and it was a fairly small club in in the Czech Republic. I forget what town it was. It was sold out, which is great. We sold out like almost all the gigs, which was just really amazing. Um, and I walk in with the amp and that we're setting up and the sound guy could seem kind of like you know, making a, a bit of a face. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, you know, um, I was worried you were gonna be loud, but I didn't touch the PA once the whole night. It's like it wasn't, it was totally 
perfect volume wise. Like I, I didn't even, you handled all the, the volume. I didn't have to turn up a solo or turn you down. I'm like, yeah, like that's being a professional, you know? So it was a funny thing with the guys in the band. That's when I looked at them and got kind of like, nah, see, told you. And then we did another gig where this band opened up for us and they were brutally loud. And I looked at those guys, I'm like, that's loud. And they're like, okay, you're totally right. You're totally right. Just not used to playing a bit more rock oriented stuff. So for me, it's gotta be loud enough to where it's compelling, where the amp feels kind of like an amp. And I, I, so many guys are using fractals on the road now. It can be done. I'm just, I've just never done it. So I'm a little nervous about it, but I think it's worth investigating. And also like, I know it's gonna sound good. It's never gonna sound bad where sometimes Amps, as as uh, Jose was saying, that um, some days they just don't sound as good because of tubes or the weather or you're not loud enough, all those things. I'll check out the Fender one. It's really inexpensive, too. John Cordy said he really liked it, too. So I'm just looking for light and, and good sounding. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for hanging out. Um, yeah, I didn't do any pitching of stuff that, norm that uh, BB would normally do. If you like my channel, please hit the like and subscribe. It really helps a lot. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Um, I've got way more people who watch my videos and actually subscribe to them. If you like the channel and you don't have any of my courses, it's, it's how I make my living. Uh, and you guys are great and they're all very affordable. Right here I get my um, solo blues guitar course, 50% off. That's being able to play a solo blues and go into a few different ones on that. One of the most important things I've worked on, I think everybody should be working on this. Um, and then the other thing, I have my triad bundle. I'm just copying this. So I've got 30% off of my triad bundle, which, and right there. And then finally, um, my free arpeggios unlocked ebook and mini course. If you guys don't have this, it's free. It's on me. It's, it's, it's really good. <laughs> I think it's really good. I just explained to you how you work through all your arpeggios, how you learn your arpeggios, how you can go through them give you charts for it. It's a mini course. I did it for a number of reasons. One, I, I really appreciate everybody being here. Also, um, in terms of one of the, in terms of making a full course on learning how to, I'm going to do courses on using your arpeggios, but a whole course on learning your arpeggio, uh, it's very, I didn't, I don't need a whole really long course on learning. So I can always refer to any of the other courses. I can start referring back to that. So please sign up for that. That's free if you already have not done so. And any of my courses, if I'm talking about a major seventh arpeggio or a dominant seventh arpeggio, you're not sure of me, just jump over there. So for me, it's really cool to have as a nice reference guide. Um, and thanks for everybody who's been here. Oh, just a question. What amplifier, um, what amplifiers, uh, just a question. What amplifies the volume, the speaker, or the, f what, just a question. What amplifies the volume, the speaker, or the fractal? Uh, the speaker. The fractal is just like a, a pedal. It doesn't make any sound. You have to write it into something, if that's what you're asking. Also, somebody said bad power is, bad power is a huge issue with tube apps. Absolutely. And noise, all those things. Yeah, so that's another thing. All right, everyone. Oh, here's the link to the arpeggio unlocked. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be on next week just because I'm doing the gig with Matt. Schofield at the bitter end. If you are in New York, please check us out at the bitter end. Um, tickets are available next Wednesday, is April 24th at 9.30 p.m. It's with me and Richard Hammond playing bass and my friend Rodney Howard on drums, my normal band. It's gonna be a ton of fun. Christine, Matt's girlfriend, Tabacus is gonna come down and sing with us in some tunes. Um, there's a rumor of a live stream. If there is, I will post a little thingy here. I don't know. Sometimes they do a live stream. Uh, but if you can come in person, please do. All right, everybody. You're the best. I appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out for an hour and 40 minutes. And I'll, uh, I'll see you guys later.